I wish I never had to record this video, but what Gotham just recently said about me in one of his previous live streams, I guess just gives us no choice. Just watch. What's up, Alex? I was just joking about the fact that... Well, you know what? No, I, w I wasn't joking. Uh, we have we recommend the exact same things, Alex. You know, Alex, you know how I feel about you? You know, I'm gonna be honest. You know how I feel about you? I feel like the guy that's ran the town. I feel like the guy that's ran the mafia. All right, and here's a young up-and-coming guy who sounds like this and has a very light, you know, accent, like a European, very respectful accent. And then here you are saying, play the Vienna and play the Karl Khan. And all of a sudden, you and I are competing for the exact same business. You and I are trying to get the loan, the loan money from the restaurants and from the, from, the, from the laundromats, all right, and from the small businesses. And here you are on the streets of my little town. All right, everybody, you've heard him. Now, there is not really that many things you can do to solve this situation. I mean, trying to challenge Levy to a chess boxing match is probably not the best idea since the list of people that are waiting to fight him is pretty long in front with Andrea Botez, of course. So, we had to battle it down on the chessboard and in today's video, I'm gonna be showing you the three games that I played against Gotham Chess, walking you through my thinking process as an international master and oh boy, will really try to make him regret what was said during that live stream. Of course, getting this unexpected match got me very anxious and nervous in the same time. The only thing I can really compare this with is back in the days when I was uh, 12 years old and holding hands with a girl for the first time where the tricky part is that you need to keep a decent conversation while trying to hide your erection. And I know some of you may be going hard in the comments saying, Oh, dude, come on, this cannot really be an issue for a micro pin London system player just like yourself. And I totally get where that comes from. And uh, let me actually agree with you on that. But the bigger issue was that I was about to bust a nut of biblical proportions. I mean, who knows? Looking back at it, I may have very well just shit myself. So... Now that you get a little bit of a better understanding of where my headspace was during these games, uh, let's actually see what happened. So I open up the game with d4, simply trying to unleash the power of the best London system course of all time. So make sure to check that one out if you want to add a few extra inches to your penis. Now opponent, however, has a bit of a different idea and immediately takes the game into an interestingly weird position after playing the move b6. And I'm just sitting there questioning myself, all right, Gotham, why are you doing this? With buff now, this is not great, but this is sort of an invitation for why to play aggressive and make me uh, exit my little London system cave and go ahead and play something fancy, which we both know I'm never gonna do. So go ahead, play knight f3. When I go bishop to b7, and uh, I go ahead and play uh, the London move, not being worried of bishop takes on f3 because we can take back uh, towards the center, and with the bishop pair we should be better. When I play z6, I go e3, and for one move, the game is looking pretty normal. Until my opponent plays the next move, which is f5. And what this does, it's simply transposing into the Dutch defense. And we both know the Dutch is getting pretty weird. Good or bad, uh, you know, the Dutch will be uh, quite messy. This, of course, rings a bell to, let's say, like the famous Petrosian quote who said that uh, something along those lines where if you know your opponent is trying to play the Dutch defense, you may very well just let him. So, yes, the Dutch has a pretty bad reputation unless you're kind of a reborn version of Simon Williams in his teens. Uh, it may be pretty risky to do, but hey, here we are. So f5 on the board. Now I go ahead and play the move bishop to e2, which is uh, the main theoretical idea. Common mistake that I see a lot of people do all the time, including my students, they're going for the move c4, which is the right plan, but the uh, wrong timing, because black could get annoying bishop b4, knight e4 type of ideas. So you may very well just want to stay away from it. So therefore, I'm just improving the move order a little bit by going bishop to e2. We see knight f6, castle, bishop to d6. Now, once again, we both know the Dutch is strange, but this move is taking it to the very next level. Now, 
I obviously saw this in the past. It's not like a completely new concept, but from my experience, the London system players really hate to see this. So perhaps this could also end up being a little bit uh, educational. So I knew at this point, I basically have uh, two ways of playing, either to take or the surprising move C4 to just let them take on F4, which is I think strongest. It's the recommendation in my chessable course that I was of course unable to recall during the game. Um, yeah, just a side uh, note that bishop g3 won't make much sense since after trading, you're not going to have the rook on the open file. So I go ahead and just uh, trade. Play the move c4, castle, knight c3, knight e4, bring their rook into the game. Um, opponent goes queen to f6, and now uh, let's take the following scenario. You're just chilling into your house and a stranger just blasted through the door. and you know, just is walking into your house, perhaps even saluting your girlfriend. What are you going to do? Come on, don't tell me that you're going to still be focused on your blitz games or do whatever because you care of your rating. I mean, I get it, but you will have to take care of the stranger first. So this is exactly how you can think about a knight on e4 and just about any strong pieces of your opponents in general. We'll just get rid of it immediately. What it takes uh, with a pawn, of course, going very aggressive, hitting the knight. Just go ahead, move the knight. C knight a6. And at this point, this is a pretty interesting position to discuss because it's quite closed and uh, a lot of uh, the low rated players have a hard time uh, coming up with a plan. So I can tell you a secret that I generally use to come up with an idea because, uh, let's be honest, most of the times I'm clueless. So, uh, what I generally like to do, I try to identify what is our stronger side and just play on it. So if you think about it, let's say into this position, opponent does have control over the open file, meaning that they kind of own the king side. So we just need to focus on the other side with these pawns and try to expand. So I play a3, queen to g6, I go b4, just taking some space, knight c7, and now time to do something. I just strike in the center. Knight e8, defending the pawn, I keep on activating, and already we have a pretty nice advantage. We see bishop to d5, which, okay, I'm just gonna be going ahead, take the free pawn. If there is a trick that I'm missing, so be it, I'm just gonna take what looks to be free. And now opponent goes rook to f5, which is a very aggressive signal, saying basically he's gonna go all in on the king side. Either going rook f8, rook g5, this kind of ideas. Just trying to go ahead and attack my king. I go ahead and ignore it, play rook c7, of course. And he goes rook to g5, which at the time really felt like a little bit of a premature attackulation. But perhaps it's actually necessary, otherwise white's position is just too good. I go ahead and just uh, defend with g3, like any half-decent human being would do. And he goes ahead and plays rook to d8. And I feel like most people could be potentially underestimating black's counterplay. Let's say if you go for something like rook takes on a7. Yeah, just taking the seemingly free pawn. I mean, this could easily get very tricky. Like imagine he plays h5. And if you, I don't know, just make another weird move. He plays h4. You're not careful. Uh, one move later, he will be sacrificing the rook. I know, how ironic. And then he just gets like uh, the perpetual. So I'm completely winning, of course. I cannot allow uh, such things. And uh, therefore, I try to come up with something that is a little bit quicker. Um, also, do not make the mistake to play h4 because that allows rook g3 immediately. So just go ahead and play rook c2. I mean, queen c2. That's obviously a queen, not a rook. I don't know why would you say that. And um, he goes ahead, plays the only kind of aggressive idea that black still has, kind of the last uh, bullet, let's say. I go rook c8, c queen to e8, and by the way, instead of rook c8, the computer recommends a move that I have missed, which I have to agree would have even been uh, leading to a nicer winning position. So you can pause the video, go ahead, try and find it. If you can, uh, if you're like a 500, probably you won't, so the move is rook d7. And why is that so clever? After rook d7, we have queen to c8, checking the king, and then picking up the rook, winning a pawn in the process. Pretty cute tactic. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, 
blind uh, squirrel, so <laughs> I'm not gonna see that. I play rook c8, I exchange, and I go for simple play, queen c7 infiltrating, attacking a7 pawn. When it goes queen e8, which is the right call, uh, keeping queens on the board is definitely his only chance to stay in the game, because otherwise I would have easily winning endgame. However, I really force the issue and do manage to get uh, rid of the queens. Now I have a completely winning position, a minute on the clock. This should be pretty handy, or at least you may think so. Base king takes f7, I go rook c7, just uh, double attack. Bishop to c6 gets played, and now at this point I start to get really nervous all of a sudden because I just feel like the victory is really close and I'm about to beat Graf and chess. I take on a7, plays b5, and uh, yeah, I actually spent quite a bit of time on playing rook takes on a7 because I was trying to evaluate whether the end game arising after b5 is winning. I couldn't really make up my mind. I take on a7, planning to maybe do it next. So he plays it himself. Now, it's also like a little bit of a, sort of a bad luck, I would say, because I go for the move a4. When it takes, I go b5, bishop takes on b5, and the whole point of sacrificing my queen side was rook a5, which is pinning the rook and most of the time just winning a piece. But there is actually a pretty hidden move that also the computer, I mean, the that com engine kind of fails to spot at the beginning and that's simply getting back into the game so once again you can try to pause and see if you can find it and uh he plays this instantly he was like very you know slippery like he got a bad position but really took the most out of his chance he plays a3 which is basically just trying to deflect my rook if i take the pawn the bishop remains uh, hanging so i go ahead trade bishops only move he goes a2 now Simply, I am pinned and I have to give up on the bishop. And we get the following endgame where, uh, yeah, to remind everybody, I have 17 seconds against 48 mobs. So it's definitely going to be a pretty tense uh, time scramble. I go rook a7 and he plays h3. According to the computer, it was better to take on h4. At this point, I'm just kind of guessing it. I cannot really have a clear understanding whether it's better to just win the d7 pawn and allow h3. So I'm just going with the flow, basically. I take on d7. Now I need to not get checkmated in one. So I play king f1. He starts checking. He knows he has a perpetual. I could avoid the perpetual if I want, but I just don't have a lot of time. And he is actually going for a win despite being losing just because I have only 10 seconds left. And... At this point, the computer just finds a clinical winning move, which in the game I have missed, and that is rook d8, simply preparing rook f8 and then the pawn promotes. I go for another nice trick, going rook g7, and in case he takes it, I go d7 and promote, so that's gg. But he goes ahead and brings the rook back. I play d7, now it's gonna be a huge uh, time scramble, he checks me, rook is hanging for a moment, it's just a huge clown fiesta, I have two seconds left, but uh, I do eventually run out of time in the following position after making a few more moves because uh, he's simply way too quick. And uh, despite the fact that I have three extra pawns in the rook endgame, I am unable to either exchange his rook or uh, yeah, promote the pawns. So first game, I go down from a completely winning position. But luckily, I do get uh, another bullet in the next game. Now, before we dive into the following game, which is going to be perhaps one of the most interesting of the match, because I'm about to play the Kaoru Khan, kind of using his own repertoire, which is leading to a pretty interesting scenario. But I just want to mention for the kids that are watching this video saying that, Oh, you said in the title that you're going to show how to beat him three times. Well, I'm showing you how to get a winning position. You beat him from there. Rook and three pawns against Rook. You do the job, okay? So, <laughs> now that we cleared that one out, we can move on to the, uh, yeah, actual game. So he goes for e4. Now, this obviously got me really pumped because uh, I am currently working uh, on my own chessable course on the Karo Khan, and I'm very excited to try out some of my own stuff. So I go for it. Plays d4, I go d5, and then he goes for the advance. I go for c5, of course. You'll have to see this move. And he goes for d takes on c5. I play the move knight to c6, which is what makes it very interesting because kind of the main theoretical move nowadays is to just play this kind of sad e6, uh, going back into this kind of range defense type of positions. And like, don't get me wrong, this is probably the best line objectively. 
forget about the word probably it is for sure the best line objectively is just that uh knight c6 is leading to such interesting positions that i feel like are way easier to play for lower rated players specifically so this is what i'm gonna be focusing on and now he goes for the move that is actually known to be the best counter i even made a video in the past where i'm talking a little bit about his approach so uh we can check that one out uh too uh if you want to hear a little bit about the opening battle now plays the move f4 and this is pretty annoying to deal with but there is one line that can lead to a very interesting game and that is specifically what i played in this game which is not a very natural move it's simply going knight h6 and uh Yes, it does look pretty ugly in the first place, placing the knight on the rim, but it's preparing to get a bishop out. So, hey, not too bad at the end of the day. Now, from what I remember, the best objectively for white is, uh, I mean, white has many moves, but one of the best is knight f3 and on bishop g4 to play bishop to d3, something that they rarely do. But the line that uh, Gotham Chess actually goes for is one that is very rare and very interesting. And I have to say, if you're not aware of this, it will probably get you in trouble. So he plays the move C3, which is kind of like a very sneaky approach, basically saying, okay, I know you want to go bishop G4, so I can just uh, sneak my queen out onto the queen side while hitting the spawn on B7. Now, luckily for me, uh, this chapter is already done in the course, so I already had covered it and I kind of reminded what to play. That is the move queen to c7, which is setting up a pretty nice little trap because in case white goes for queen d5, you can easily get in trouble after a move such as rook d8 and then the rook is going to come over to d1. So you don't want to do that, okay? What normally white ends up playing here is h3 and we play bishop to d7 and then uh, let's say the positions are, are kind of complex, but I feel black is getting very interesting play. Now, in the game, my opponent played a pretty surprising move. I think he simply forgot about the fact that he could do h3 and I don't have such a good square for the bishop. But he goes bishop to a2 after a bit of a thing. And here, what do we do? I got a choice of taking on e2, because trades are generally fine in the Karukan. But that will be helping him develop. So I decide uh, to just play e6 and let him take if he wants to. Opponent played bishop to e3. Very natural move, just developing and kind of waiting with that tension for a, for a bit. And at this point, the computer suggests like a pretty shocking move if you are, let's say, new for these positions. So why not go ahead pause the video try to find it uh, on your own i was familiar with this idea because it's just very standard for the line it's just that because it was a blood scheme i had to react immediately i couldn't really figure out uh, what is like the most precise way of doing it so i'll give you a hint normally the way this happens it's knight f5 bishop f2 and then you play g5 by the way this is what we had in the game just that i didn't play g5 here why not because uh, actually, for some reason, I thought g4 is a problem. Forgetting about the fact that I can just go 97. And the main idea is that uh, then we want to take. And this pawn on e5 becomes very vulnerable. That's the whole idea of playing g5 undermining white center. So uh, in the game, I failed to do that. The funny thing is that the computer even recommends it directly. In this position, and like a potential line could be something like pawn takes, bishop takes e2 go knight uh, g4 and then something like rook g8 with 95 next pawn is very weak and black has uh yeah full equality here according to lila i did a little bit of digging and uh, we do get very nice activity so hey very good sign for the line um if you're looking to try this out remember we're dealing with uh, one of the toughest uh, ways that white can play and black gets very fun and interesting play so uh what's not to like there Instead, sticking to what happened in the game, I decided to take and go knight f5, hitting the bishop. Opponent just retreats to f2, very standard. And now, you know, I was uh, worried of g4. I was like, okay, he plays g4, I'm gonna die. I cannot allow that. I go h5, bad move. Just very slow and 
Now white is actually getting a much better position with just very easy moves. I still go for g5 because that's what you need to do. Otherwise, we're going to just be down a pawn. He plays knight f3. Knight to d4 after. Uh, in hand side, I should have continued with the main point of taking and then this pawn is weak with like a pretty unclear position. I make a mistake, of course, because uh, yes, I'm not using any anal beads in case you couldn't tell so far. Pawn goes knight f5. Pretty forcing continuation. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and uh, this looks like uh, okay. Black is kind of surviving. Main point is that queen d5 allows queen b6 uh, check. Boom. And then the pawn will be hanging. So that's why he's not taking immediately. Plays rook d1. Now, okay, I need to get castled somewhere. So I decide to go queen side. Same trap is in the position. If he takes, we can exchange and then play queen b6, pick up the pawn on b2. That's a constant motive. He just goes 94, and at this point, the position is very unpleasant. My king is kind of vulnerable. I have a pawn that's a clear target. His king is very safe, and I don't really have uh, too many ways of creating counterplay. However, after spending like 15 seconds, I think I come up with the best practical chance. So uh, that is the move uh, f6. Why is that the practical chance? Well. Position is like still bad, of course, but it gives white some ways to potentially go wrong. Like what happens if he just takes? Well, nothing. Just play like rook eight, and at least he will have a hard time playing rook d5 because the rook needs to cover that pawn. So in the game, he does not take and play rook e1. I go rook eight, okay, just kind of trying to hang on. He plays rook takes on d5 now after a bit of a think. And then he instantly plays the move king to g3. That was pretty shocking news to me. Now. Is king g3 like the best move in the position? Well, like, it's clearly not if you, let's say, spend more than five seconds, which he did not. So if white plays a move like, let's say, queen d4 or king f1, they're still better. But king to g3 is actually leading to a completely losing position, simply turning the table into my favor. But keep in mind that black has only one winning move in this position. Other than that, it's not going to be great. So you can try to pause the video and go ahead, find it. In case you haven't looked at uh, in the right of the screen, uh, for a spoiler, then <laughs> you still have pretty good chances to do it. So, point is that I have a very simple uh, deflection, and generally, whenever there's like a tactic involved, you need to look for the forcing moves. So, very forcing, go for a check, h4. There's only one move, king takes, and I go queen to f2. Now, at this point, I kind of celebrated a little bit too early, thinking that he has to play g3, and then I can mate him in multiple ways. But he finds king h5. And believe it or not, even though we're about to collect a full rook, the following position is pretty unclear. I mean, if he takes on f6, this pawn is like very close of promoting, the king is supporting it, I don't really have a clear way of getting to his king, and man, I'm like super nervous in the first place. And the game becomes really chaotic. So he did not play this move in the game, which would have been a bit better according to the computer, but he went for the checks, which is pretty natural. So he checked me twice and then took on f6. Basically with these checks, he's saying that the queen is now covering the f8 square, so making it easier to push. Now I only have 45 seconds left. He has about a minute, as you can see on the screen. And... I figure out the position should be winning, it's just that I need a little bit of time to kind of uh, find a way to deal with his annoying threats. So I check him, he plays king g6, and now I find the best move, queen h4. Just, that is simply threatening to checkmate him in uh, various ways or make the king uh, run away from supporting the pawn. The problem with this move is that uh, it took me 16 seconds, which was uh, almost uh, half the time that was remaining on the clock. And uh, after queen f5, I managed to stabilize, get a completely winning position. But already at this point, with only 10 seconds left on the clock, I have only one move that is giving black a winning position. So please go ahead, try to pause the video, find it on your own. There is only one move that is going to be good enough. So the move that I missed during the game was the fact that uh, I can go queen h8. You may be wondering, okay, I don't get it. Queen h8, what? Cannot he take the rook? Well, no, because that is a check. 
So we go queen a j check. King has to move. Let's say I can still check him or whatever. He goes away and then can just block. And we're gonna be easily able to pick up the pawn. And well, from what I know, end games with an extra rook should be winning generally. So uh yeah. Couldn't really find that in a time scramble. And I go for the kind of obvious queen g1, trying out my luck, but his king manages to hide. After king a3, I have no more checks. I can give one on a6, but that's a queen trade, and then he promotes. So, uh, yeah, a bit of like, uh, yeah, table tennis eval game. Uh, the ball really jumped from, uh, you know, one field to the other. He was, let's say, I got a good opening. Like, in the opening, if I go ahead and play g5 with the right timing, I think black can easily take over the initiative the way this happened. Then I mess it up and white is clearly better. I should get no counterplay. Then he makes this huge blunder that's like really pissing me off, just giving me completely winning possession. But okay, it wasn't uh it wasn't really an obvious fine. Now that I even look uh, look at it back. While I was playing this game, I felt like the win was more obvious than I think it really was so uh good news however he accepts another challenge and i do get the white pieces trying to finally get revenge all right everybody this is gonna be the last game of the match and despite the fact that i do feel pretty shitty and still i cannot believe that i have missed those two games we have one chance to go we have to win winner takes it all e4. Now, you would be expecting something maybe like a Karo Khan or something more normal, but it does seem like his strategy is to make it incredibly weird and confuse the heck out of both of us, it seems, at least for me now. And uh, you can try to guess the opening that he went for, or in case you looked in the top uh, right, you already know he did go for the French defense. Okay, French defense. What do we do? I just play d4. Get the center. They have the static position on the board. And here, even though I have to say, I do recommend the move bishop to d3 in my chessable course, which is a line that's pretty fury heavy and uh, requires you, I don't know. Uh, what you're doing there like you really need to have the move by move down in order to be successful with this variation and i decide against that i'm just like okay let me play something that uh, i have sort of looked recently and that is simpler to play and uh, you guessed it right that is the advance and i know what you may be thinking oh he has to break in the center now that's a must. He is going to be playing the move c5. There's simply no other way around it. That's what I thought too. But no. You already know that the games are not really going to be taking a theoretical path. And uh, they just go into like kind of a weird, interesting sort of battle. And he plays the move 97. Yes, 97. Okay. What do we do? I guess just try to... Uh, follow up with uh, normal looking moves. I go knight f3. And now still, no pawn c5 move. But plays b6. Now, the move b6 is in fact pretty logical. And the point is pretty simple. In case you don't understand what is the idea of the b6 move, and you may be thinking he's going for some kind of fianchiero, well, he might... But that's not really quite the point. The main point is to go bishop to a6. And what that does, it will be getting rid of his bad bishop. So, it's kind of a nice idea if you think about it. However, because the French just sucks, black is much worse even after that. Which is something that took me a while to realize. Even if black ends up getting this trade because uh, it's pretty time consuming and white has, uh, let's say, a pretty significant base advantage we still keep a better position so uh i start with the move c3 which is just a typical kind of positional move just reinforcing the center and 
Also setting up a little bit of a trap in case he goes bishop to a6, which he didn't. But you can feel free to go ahead, pause the video, and try to guess why uh, bishop to a6 would have been a massive blunder. And uh, I would have been uh, ready to capitalize on it after taking. And then these pieces are pretty vulnerable. So move queen a4 wins it all. Of course, none of this happened, but the bishop to b7 instead. It's interesting because he could have also uh, played maybe a5 with the same idea. There's no real way that white can, let's say, really stop the bishop trade. But once again, why would you stop it if it's bad? So, uh, see bishop to b7, just develop, c5, castling, and then he goes knight e6. You may be wondering, what is going on? Like, he's got this knight that needs to get developed, but moves this one again. Well, this is kind of a natural move, like knight c6, the other one could go to d7. He could also have developed this one to c6, the other one to f5, I guess. Anyways, that's not really very critical, so let's move on. Knight c6. Now, I go for a little a3 move on the queen side, which is very standard, just... Preparing this type of b4 advance in the future, because in these kind of variation, white normally tries to play on both sides, because we have more space and this just lets us uh, uh, drive the game in any direction we want, really. So, uh, black goes bishop to e7. I go rook e1. And at this point, I'm like pretty happy if he goes for something like castle, because it can just maneuver, like... Knight d2, uh, knight f1, maybe get it to g3, maybe go to e3 and then to g4. I'm going to have a lot of pieces next to his king while, uh, yeah, black hardly gets any kind of play. But here, credits to him. He goes for a very interesting move and try to go ahead, pause the video. Uh, if you're already a loyal subscriber, you may be even, uh, you know, able to guess your contents creator move. Because, well, I kind of expected it. I wasn't, like, entirely sure that he is going to be playing this. But here he goes. G5. Heard it right. G5. But now you know what's even crazier about this? The best way to deal with this, according to Lila, it's a move that you have no idea. I give you 10 guesses. You simply have no way of uh, finding what the move actually is. Well, maybe wondering... Uh were you able to point it during the game? Well, of course not. I'm not, not Lila. Like, what do you expect? Should Once again, if you come up from channels like Daniel Naroditsky or GM Hikaru, make sure you load your expectations, okay? You're here. You're here to have a good time. Maybe learn a thing or two. But we're not for the best chess of all time. Even though I do play the best chess of all time sometimes. Anyways, uh, G5. What do we need to do? Well, uh, you may be wondering, uh, let's try to stop it. Go h3. That's a move. That's fine. What else? Uh, let's go b4. Ignore. Play on the queen side. Uh, maybe go g4. All of these are reasonable guesses, but it is not the best move. And quite shockingly, the best move according to Lila in this position is so counterintuitive that I think it just makes it almost impossible to find. And that is h4. Yes, h4. King onto that side. No rook supporting the pawn. But you're just chilling, going h4. What is the point? You may be wondering. So, first of all, g4, uh, you can move the knight uh, somewhere and then the pawn is weak. So, this is pretty nice. I actually forgot to check what h4. It's apparently knight g5 that needs to be played. Because d4 is also hanging and so on. And... Like, if he goes h6, I assume there's some kind of crazy sacrifice, like knight f7 and then queen g4. So, apparently, this is just crashing. And, uh, well, the line that I did check was pawn takes. I was more curious, okay, what's the point with this? Then you have bishop to h6. And it's actually not that easy to play as black, not at all. Like, rook g8 allows bishop takes on h7 in a lot of lines. Plus, you can go something like knight e2, knight h2, queen h5, get the knight to g4, and black is simply having a hard time finishing development here. So, 
that is all kind of nice and interesting, but not what happened in the game. So in the game, I feel sort of okay about my reaction. I feel like this could have been the best uh, way to deal with uh, Black's play in a lot of instances, but I have to say I did overlook the crazy plan that uh, Gotham Chess was actually able to find. The way he played the following couple of moves is actually quite impressive and uh, I really mean it with that. So I go h3, nothing crazy so far. Um, he plays h5 and I go g4. Uh, at this point, by the way, computer doesn't really care that much. It just goes like, uh, if I remember correctly, maybe bishop e3, maybe knight bd2, and then he just he's like g4, okay, take. I think computer really gives something along these lines, like take knight h2, just chilling. We're not going to get made by a single pawn. Although, I have to say, even though we're going to be winning this, if black manages to cast along, get a rook onto g8, I definitely see some uh, practical issues with us. Because, you know, black may be getting some attack one day. Uh, I go for the typical reaction. I play g4. Now, for the noobs watching this video, g4 may be looking like super weakening. But in fact, it's not. And the way the game actually continued really proves it. But uh, in this position, apparently, it turns out not to be the best, even though the position is objectively close to equal. So opponent goes for takes. And now, once again, you remember I called you out on finding what uh, Lila plays in that position and you won't be able to find it out of like 10 moves? Well, we can kind of do the same exercise here, except Gotham actually play this move. So you can go ahead, pause for a bit, and try to find the stunning move that is actually computer approved. And he played within seconds. He spent only three seconds on this move. I mean, how crazy. I wouldn't have really ever played this one. I think, but I don't know. I'm not with a black piece, so I cannot tell. And in case you took your time, king to d7 is on the board. And yes, that is a great move. Now, the way he followed it up was not particularly great, but the move in itself is simply amazing. So, uh, yeah, I continued knight d2. Uh, sorry, I played king g2 first, uh, preparing rook h1. He went uh, bishop a6. I decide to keep bishops on because I'm trying to say this bishop is not really doing that much. And now he makes a pretty weak move. He plays uh, c4. Having he gone something like king c7, bishop e3, knight d7, knight d2, and then queen to uh, g8, with ideas to break with f6, black is completely fine. Perhaps even has an easier position to play. Luckily for me, he didn't. And he does go for the move c4 instead, which is basically saying, all right, I'm going to give you the king side. I'll try to do something on the queen side with these pawns. Like his plan is, okay, he's got more space here. I'm about to just push and hope for the best, which for blades, that was played pretty quick and that's good. But in a longer time control, this is a very, really, very, very risky strategy. <laughs> very, really risky strategy. You get it. Okay, how do I punish this? I just continue with normal development. Bishop e3, get my pieces out, knight e2, b5. I could do rook h1, but we do a little bit of maneuvering first. So white has a great way to improve the position, just maximizing uh, our structure. So once again, you can go ahead and uh, try to find a move. I did play knight f1 in case you are a 400 noob that doesn't know the knight move backwards. Point was to get it to g3 so that uh, it's just much better. It could jump to h5. Um, it's just um, kind of nice to have it there. Um, point goes knight to c7, just not really doing much. I target the g5 pawn. At this point, we got the g5 pawn. We know that for sure. I'm going to be at least up a pawn. And he goes for the move a5. I get rook on the open file, just basic strategy, exchange rooks, pick up the free pawn. Uh, everything looks very nice, very clean so far, up a pawn, more time on the clock. I like have two minutes at this point and he has one minute 51 seconds. So 
We got Gotham on the ropes. Yet again, are we able to beat him? I mean, I don't know. He's pretty slippery. We'll have to wait till the end. But I do have to say he did go for what I believe to be the best practical move in the position. So once again, if you really want to improve your chess, I highly advise you to try to figure out the moves whenever we do these kind of little pauses. So uh, he played the move B3. Now, pawn is not really going anywhere yet. But if there's one scenario black could get any counterplay is if they somehow sacrifice and then this pawn will save the game. So having gone BC3, he will have no real counterplay for the rest of the game, really. So, uh, okay, let's get rid of that. And just place the move B3. I step back, place queen a8, trying to infiltrate, get some counterplay. I trade the bishops, uh, go knight g5, simply sidestep uh, the attack because the bishop is under pressure. Knight to d8, knight d5, just doing uh, basic improving moves. But you have to see that I burned a lot of time on the clock. So <clears throat> the clock is once again uh, starting to get into my head. Bishop c6, I play knight f6, goes knight a8, don't ask me why, I guess he just wants knight b6 a4 winning the b2 pawn, so it kind of makes sense. Bishop g8 and he plays queen b1. Now I go bishop h7, we do this little dance and he plays knight b6. Now, I wasn't really going to repeat, I was just repeating the position so I could buy myself some time to figure out kind of like a mating net in the position. Plays knight b6, I go knight h7. We're going pretty deep, boys. All these pieces over there, that's pretty, pretty good. By the way, instead of all of these bishop moves, I could just do knight f3, queen g5, and that is pretty mating. Takes me a while to realize, I do it now. Queen b1 and then queen g5. Got him on the ropes. Okay, not a lot he can do. He plays the move queen g6. And now, white does have a checkmate in three. You can go ahead, pause the video, try to find. And the funny story is that I actually missed it. It's a force mate with checks. But I also have the reason why I did miss it. Because there's a, one previous line during the game that I really considered and... This simply caused this kind of huge blind spot in my calculation. So here, in case you're wondering, knight takes d5, double check, he has to move away. And that would be checkmate, okay? That's easy. Now, I think the more interesting part besides missing the checkmate is that... How, how can I miss it? Like, play perfect almost for, like, what he moves? You have mate in three, you miss it, dude. Like, what? What are you even doing? So let me explain you the thinking process at this point. So, there was actually one line that I remember calculating where I go queen g5 and then I go, say, knight takes on d5 and I remember that there was some position where I didn't have a mating attack but, uh, like, okay, maybe actually just show you from this point of view. Let's just say I didn't see perhaps queen c7 is checkmate. And if that is not a checkmate, my knight uh, ends up being uh, pinned. And I just lose a piece. So I calculated something similar in the game at some point. Like maybe even here. I was looking for... No, here it wouldn't make a lot of sense. But I was looking for something like that where I realized if I take on d5, I'm going to get pinned. So then whenever I landed my queen on g5, I was mainly considering perhaps going for a discovery with knight e4, if that makes any sense and you can visualize. So for this reason, uh, that simply backfired terribly after the move queen g6 because I just completely missed the winning move. And because I only have 13 seconds left, I made a pretty big mistake by taking. Now... The sad story about this is that taking is actually leading to a losing position. May not be very obvious at first, but remember the best practical move that I praised him for. 
this is gonna be winning him the game because after knight a4, Jack is picking up the pawns and this guy is about to become the hero. We're both in a time scramble, around 10 seconds each. And funny things are happening. Both sides hanging pieces left and right. Try to go for the sneaky g7 promoting. He's got a pawn that can promote himself too. But he does uh, have the patience with only 8 seconds on the clock to stop this. Everything happens really fast. I'm of course really kicking myself at this point. And we do fail to save the last gram of dignity of this game by going down yet again from a completely winning position. Three times in a row. You have no idea how pissed I was. He's just starting the first game. Like, let's do a little bit of a recap of how this match went. So first game, I do get to play him. Opening goes pretty smooth. Yeah, like, easy London system, squeeze, end game, up a pawn, he's got no moves. He finds a trick and somehow manages to survive. And then, lags me. Now, second game, I have to say, well, Opening went great. Then I just played pretty weak and sort of outplayed myself. He had a very safe position. He should be much better. He should be kind of really crashing me in the second game. But he just makes that absolute goofball. Allowing h4 and I win a full rook. I'm completely winning yet again. So... I still managed to get flagged there because position was relatively difficult to convert and here we have this game where it's basically an interesting fight but it's kind of like white is having overwhelming pressure the whole time mainly after he made this mistake like really the only mistake he made in this game was the fact that he played c4 after this there's no way back white's position is too strong and i played pretty well after and if I find the mate in three, I mean, that is a pretty well played game. So, uh, first three games against Gotham Chess, we did get flagged, every single one of them from winning positions. I still feel pretty shitty about it, but hey, if there was a scenario where we could lose 3 0 while not being incredibly p pathetic, maybe that is it. I don't know. You guys tell me in the comments. So, there is that. Hey everybody, now that you made it this far into the video, I just wanted to clarify that uh, I did take out of context that clip from the intro. So, uh, the conversation that I've had with Levy was uh, after our games actually and not in front. And I did this specifically because this is how fucking YouTube works. So, uh, I just wanted to add that, uh, well, Right after that speech, he also mentioned that, hey, there is room for everybody. And he said also other nice things that uh, I'm not really going to add here. But uh, yes, just wanted to clarify that one out here. And uh, really want to add that his attitude towards the other, let's say, smaller streamers or creators is uh, very good. And uh, definitely something uh, anybody from other niches can learn because, hey, Getting successful is maybe not that hard, but staying there at the top, I guess, is really the trickier part. But I will let you know whenever I get there, if that ever happens. So, hey, thank you guys for watching and make sure to check out the other videos on the channel if you're new. So, take care.